Welcome back to the Be Transformed series. And today we're going to be talking about truth. But before we do that, I just want to remind us that there is the overarching theme verse here, which is Romans 8, 29, that God desires to mold us so that we progressively reflect inwardly the character of who Christ is. So today, truth, which is clearly a characteristic of Christ, is where we're going to focus. In our work, when we're dealing with people who come in and struggle at the Rock House Center, what we find is that there are lies. And what we have found is that there's bondage associated with those lies. And what we want to do is try to understand the dynamic of how lies become a part of our life, how we begin to believe these things, and how they affect us, and how we can resolve those things. I want you to take a moment to make sure that we're talking about the lies which we believe. We're not really addressing the issue of lying, which is another issue. We're just talking about are there lies within our heart? Do we believe things which are untrue? Because it's very clear that Christ was able to be who he was for us as our Savior and to be able to fulfill the role of being the author of our salvation because he was full of truth. To understand, um, I think, how vital that is, let's first look at just the benefit of truth. On this slide that you have before you, there is a scripture that relates to the blessing of truth. And it reads, May grace, God's favor and peace, which is perfect well-being, all necessary good, all spiritual prosperity and freedom from fears and agitating passions and moral conflicts be multiplied in you in the full, personal, precise, and correct knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. And that comes from 2 Peter 1-2. So what we can see is that your sense of well-being, your sense of wholeness, uh, your relationship with the Lord and many aspects of your life are hugely impacted by truth, and that truth is knowing who Christ is, capital T truth, we're talking about knowing who Christ is. But let's talk about the other side of that. Where is there opportunity for uh, there to be lies? And what's the implication of that? I think it's really a powerful uh, recognition or understanding to see that Satan is the father of all lies. So if we think about that, why would he be lying? He would be lying to advance his intent, which is to still kill and destroy, take away our peace, cause us to feel hopeless, take us down the road towards worldly answers to the things that we struggle with. The scripture that relates to that is John 8, 44. And it's really a, uh, a powerful one that speaks to the truth about where lies come from. And you need to kind of hear this and let it settle in because it is a, a profound reality uh, and it's something that we need to not take lightly. So in John 8, 44, it says, He, Satan, was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a falsehood, he speaks what is natural to him, for he is a liar himself and the father of lies and of all that is false. Of all that is false. He is a murderer, father of all that is false. So his purposes of trying to get you to believe a lie has to do with his desire to steal, kill, and destroy. And what we have to understand is that those things are in us, and we may know it or not know it, uh, but it has a lot to do with the quality of our life. And if we look at another scripture where Jesus talks about how uh, Satan was not able to control him, we begin to see an interesting dynamic here of why it is that God wants you to have more of the heart of Christ and to make sure that there are no lies in there that you're believing is true. So the next scripture I want to refer to, and it's in your materials as well, is John 14, 30. The context here is Jesus speaking to the disciples. I will not talk with you much more, for the prince, evil genius and ruler of the world, is coming. And he has no claim on me. He has nothing in common with me. There is nothing in me that belongs to him. And he has no power over me. Well, there you go. Satan had nothing that he had birthed into Jesus' beliefs. He had no handle on Jesus. He wasn't able to control him. So, see, Jesus was at a place where he was able to resist him because there was nothing of Satan within him. Well, that's obviously where we want to go. What we find is that there are a lot of people in life believe in a lot of lies, and they're suffering tremendously for that. Uh, many examples of people feeling like they're worthless or feeling like they're a loser or they assume a lot of things in life, all of these kinds of messages are if they're lies because God says something very different about who we are and how we are valued, and we'll get into that a little bit more in a second. But I think the message that we want to make sure we understand here is that when we have a lie in us, we're providing an access point to be controlled or manipulated or to be miserable, to be tormented by Satan. And so there's a tremendous amount at stake at getting free. 
And another aspect of understanding lies, when you start trying to figure out where your lies are coming from, let's talk about some of those sources. One of those sources is authorities. And if you look on the screen now, we're going to throw up a, a graphic that lists some of those places where you may find uh, that if you think about those relationships, you may find some lies that you're believing. And remember also when you're doing this that any statement of anyone that opposes the truth of who God says you are is a lie. And it, whilst Jesus had himself and his own purity to recognize uh, the distinction between what was lie and what was truth because he was truth, we are, we are in this place where we have to look to the truth of who God says we are so we can compare that to identify those lies and get, get them out of us. So here are some of the common sources. Authority figures. Authority figures have, and that can be a parent, it can be a coach, it could be a doctor, it could be a lawyer, just someone that you have opened your heart up and allowed them access as an authority figure in your life to make a statement over you. There are certainly a lot of cases, and I can even remember one in which I was uh, at a store here in Nashville, and a father screamed out over the cash registers to try to gain control of his son, I guess, and called him a pathological liar. Well, that's actually probably not true. He was a seven or eight year old kid who was trying to talk his dad into buying him something and his dad said no. But there's a situation where someone of, of, of really significant authority is speaking something in. The father was frustrated, it's probably not the words he would have chosen, probably wanted to end the situation, we understand all that. But if that child accepted that as truth about who he is, then he will live under that as true, whether it's true or not. Um, and so when we think about other sources, sometimes we talk to people who have had some really bad experiences with coaches. Uh, we've talked to some people who have been in the criminal justice system and they have believed a bunch of lies about themselves because of who they've been hanging around and how people have summarized the quality of their life. Some of the other sources you can look at are just assumptions you make. It's amazing how many people we talk to think they can read minds. You know, to assume through someone's behavior that that means something about them and then to live under that belief. There are a lot of people who have grown up in a situation where their parents didn't have what, maybe didn't have the time or the access or the resources to give them as much attention as they would have liked to have received. And so they interpret that as that somehow their parent didn't really care for them fully. Uh, you know, that's just a situational thing. That's an interpretation of what's going on. Could have been something very different from that. But it doesn't really matter. As a matter of fact, what we found, and we're working with people, and they come in and, and they say something to us, and we recognize that that's a lie because it's not what God says about them. We don't spend a lot of time trying to figure out where the source is. Uh, it really doesn't matter. If it's a lie, it's a lie. And it's something that they're suffering under. And it's, they're going to benefit by getting it off of them. Probably of all the things that we work on, the most foundational lie that causes the greatest suffering is a sense of worthlessness. Of, as a matter of fact, that was the one that I struggled with when I was growing up, was just the sense that I wasn't valued that I really wasn't worthy of the attention of the love, uh, just wasn't valued by other people. We find that a lot in working with folks at the Rock House Center, and that is one of the most foundational places of suffering and hurt that people have, is that sense of worthlessness. And you know, if you believe that you're worthless, you will do a lot of things based on that belief which are really not very helpful to you. And so it's very important to try to get after something so vital as our sense of, of worth as a human being. The truth is, let's talk about the truth for a minute. The truth is, is that love and value come together. If someone loves you, it's, they value you. Think about how you feel when somebody makes the effort to be with you or spends a lot of time with you. Aren't they expressing value? Think about what God has done to spend eternity with you. Think about all that he and his son have sacrificed to be reconciled and restored so that you can live with them in the kingdom forever. Think about, that's a statement of value. When we start thinking about comparing what people believe about our value or what they've said or what we believe, and you compare it to the reality of how incredibly perfect God loves you and loves you for eternity, that's where you want to rest your ladder. That's the wall you want to put your ladder on. That's the place where you want to put your stake in the ground. That's the foundation of your sense of value is that God loves you and has done a tremendous amount to establish that love through what he has done to pursue you. So we need to start looking around at who is not in agreement with God and forgive them for speaking that lie over us and to stand on the ground of who it is that God says we are because that is where our greatest sense of value is and we need to be valued as people. In a minute, we're going to work on the lie of worthless. 
but I think it's really important for us to not blow this off. This is really a big deal. The foundation of your sense of value affects so much of your life. And, you know, you may have witnessed sort of how this has played out in other people's lives. For instance, have you ever seen someone that enters into relationships that are not good for them, but they keep going back to that same relationship? Have you seen people sh be a part of some sort of a project, but just give up because they don't think that they have enough? Uh, have you had people who basically, have you seen people in your congregation or know others who simply aren't able to operate in a place of confidence? Some people just, like people who feel worthless, for instance, are not very good public speakers because they get stuck in this pattern of trying to figure out how to deal with that worth, that sense of, of low self-esteem in their own strength. So they go to, go to a lot of things trying to solve that problem. Uh, one of those things that they commonly go to are the approval of others. So. It's, it can really be a problem if you're in a place of having low self-esteem, not feeling good about yourself, but you're constantly going to men or to people, or is really what I mean by that, to, to the world, to try to deal with it through the approval of people. That's a common thing. Have you ever seen that person out there that has just been sought approval and sought approval and they can't get enough approval for them to feel whole and they continue to struggle with their life? Well, what's going on there is that they're looking for something in the world, and it's a very common thing that if they can find someone who will compliment them, that they begin to feel better, but the reality of it is it doesn't stick. It doesn't, it doesn't really deal with the problem. It's a momentary thing. You can't get enough of it because it's a man's solution to something that God has got for us to, for us to be whole. So don't blow, don't blow over this. Think about this for a minute of what kind of messages, where are you in your heart? And I just ask that God right now would just give you some inspiration about where are the lies in your heart? What do you believe about yourself? Why do you value yourself? What sort of things do you look at, at your life to assess your sense of value? If any of those things have to do with wealth, they have to do with appearance, uh, they have to do with success, they have to do with things you own, they have to do with people that are around you. All of those situations, really, what you've done is you've given those people and those situations power over a very foundational piece of your sense of well-being. And so it's really important to take this seriously, and I hope that uh, in your conversation that's coming, that you guys will banter around this in a really honest way and look at the ways in which you've looked at things of the world and try to see where it is that we need to go to reject those things and bring the truth of your value as established by God to your life. Thank you. I trust that you've had a good conversation and hopefully you're having some sense of conviction about the aspect of this issue of truth in your life. The perspective that I want you to have is the perspective of God's truth. Let's, let's reframe it one more time. God loves you perfectly. He's known you since the beginning of the foundation of everything. He has pursued you. He has paid a tremendous price for you and he desires to live with you for eternity. That's his statement of value. So ask yourself, where have you heard the alternate message? Where have you heard the message, I don't want to be with you? Where have you heard the message that you've got to earn your, your love? Where have you heard the message that unconditional love is something that you're supposed to work for, that it's a burden on you? Uh, that's what God has for you, is unconditional love. So think about the things that you believe which oppose the absolute value of the creator of the universe has established in you through his behavior and love towards you. Who has said or what has been said that opposes that truth? And now think about who it is, because if, if it's a person that you can identify, maybe not just something that you've assumed or read the mind of someone thinking that they felt the way, but if there's a person you can associate with that lie in your life, then we want to forgive them too, to complete the transaction. So think about who that is. I'm going to do the same thing. We're going to throw this prayer up on the uh, screen right now. And again, when the pauses come, I want you to enter the, the situation and enter the name of the person. So let's get started. Heavenly Father, I reject the lie that my worth can be established by anything other than you. I specifically reject the lie that if you had a particular lie that you believe that opposes this truth, stick it in there. I specifically reject the lie uh, that, whatever it is, I accept the truth that you love me and value me perfectly. I declare your truth that you value me immensely and desire to have me with you in your kingdom for eternity. I reject all the lies I have believed about my worth from how people have treated me or what they have spoken over me or any other lie that opposes the truth of how much you love and value me. I also forgive them and ask you to forgive them as well. Father, I ask you to heal 
these people of their lives that they suffer under so that they can be free of suffering and can prosper. Father, get, forgive me for believing a lie that opposes your truth. I desire to live my life under your truth and ask for the strength to resist any belief that opposes your truth. Father, I desire to always be sensitive to your leading, to know when I have believed a lie, and ask for your help to reject it and live by the truth and your glory. Father, please remove from me the torments that have been the result of the lies that I have believed. I ask all these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. If you were in the first session and you authentically prayed, you'll see on the left side that there are, uh, there's one heart from our previous session. Now, if you have authentically prayed that prayer for truth in your life, this next graphic will show you that there's more of the heart of Christ. There's more white in that heart. There's a place where a handle Satan had, an opportunity to influence, to be influenced by Satan has been removed. And if you'll see that as we make these changes, are you, as you do this work, the heart on the left has more and more resemblance and more reflects the heart on the right, which is the heart of Christ. And from that will come greater peace, a sense of well-being, and allow you to more live in a place of confidence in your life and in your relationship with the Lord. I hope you've been blessed by today's session.